Beautiful, stirring. Thank you. Flora Zanchek, thank you so much. Anthony, that was terrific. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. A song about um, a young man and a young woman who uh, are betrothed, and they he's thinking of breaking up because he's afraid of what people are going to say about them and she says that their love is stronger than this it's stronger than steel or iron it's an interesting song it's a it's a narrative and there's two different people are, singing do you always throw yourself in, even in our studio here or whether you're on stage in, in an opera are you always right there with the character emotionally well yes but what's interesting is uh, whether that reads or not in some situations I, I, I've learned that what you feel and what is projecting are sometimes two different things. What is your goal when you're, I mean, at Metropolitan Opera or a big opera house? How do you how do you make that emotion transcend to the back of the house? Well, it's different in a, if you're singing opera because, um, first of all, if you're at the Met, they can hardly see your face, so it reads in your body <laughs> and how for you the use. Opera yes, yes, reads how you do the words, how you interpret the text. Um, uh, your body movement, how you, in, how you interpret it in terms of movement. I uh, mentioned the uh, Bellini role, uh, the Norma coming up for you. What, yes. what, what's challenging about that? Why is it such a difficult role? Well, it's a very difficult role. It's almost a soprano role, and uh, sometimes it's transposed down. Uh, we're doing it in the original key, so there I have some high C's in there. Uh, but uh, Adult G's is a very interesting role because it's one of the, it's probably the only ingenue role that I do. <laughs> I usually play these tortured women, uh, <laughs> you know, killed babies and... <laughs> I love the storyline. <laughs> Condemn <opera>. people to life, <laughs> to the death. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting slip. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it's really interesting because Adalgisa is uh, uh, that wretched tea that she has right in the beginning, just before she, she really gets into the meat of her singing, in a way is the best... Thing for her, she has a messa in voce, which mm, starts on a high A that. flat. Start on a pinpoint of sound, and you get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then you diminuendo back to a pinpoint of sound. Oh. And uh, it's uh, very few singers do it, and uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to doing it. I discovered something with Adalgisa was what I discovered about uh, bel canto roles that there are a lot of vocal devices that you use as theatrical expressions, and if you don't know what they are. Um, it's very difficult to interpret bel canto. Well, first there's the word, and then there's, uh, like for example, how you sing an aside. Uh, Adalgisa has an aside that she sings right there with Polione, but it's almost like the lights change and she's in a totally different voice. She sings with, a, you, you, there are many ways you can do it. 
Uh, one of the beauties of bel canto is that it accommodates a wider range of voice type and a uh, wider range of interpretation in terms of how, what you do with it, how you, how you can make it work. And uh, so you can have a fairly light voice sing Adalgisa, or you can have a fairly heavy voice sing Adalgisa, and it will still work. You can do the same with uh, uh, Leonora in Favorita. It's the same thing. You can, you can play it with many different weights of voices, whereas if you sing Mozart or Verdi, you're pretty much stuck with the weight of voice that you have in order to uh, interpret it. Uh, I, there's nothing for me in Mozart because I'm, my voice is too big. <laughs> so it's, 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 you know, it's difficult to, to sing. There, there's a few arias I could do. I could do the Mozart Requiem because it lies so low that it balances with the quartet. Have you always had that power, or is that something you worked on? Yes, I've always had the power, but I didn't know how to use my voice. That came later. I had to learn how to do that. How did, how did that come about? I studied with a very good voice teacher, an excellent voice teacher by the name of Ted Puffer, and he taught me how to sing, basically. What were you doing before that that you didn't think well, was singing? Well, I had no high notes. I had no low notes. Um, I didn't know how to use my chest voice. Uh, there were a lot of problems. It was a loud sound, but it was uh, pushed. There were a lot of problems. I, I saw you recently at the, at the Mad in Il Travatore. There was it, it written about a lot because there was a, sort of an unusual staging that they had, and they made some changes in the middle of the run of the production with the set. How, how do you as a performer deal with that, where you've got some changes in the middle of a production like that? Well, in my case, it didn't affect me too much because I had worked things out before I even got to that point. Um, um, Graham Vick was, is a wonderful stage director in the sense that if you present him with your homework, he helps you a lot. And he helped me a lot with the role, helped me a lot in how I interpreted the role. And I told him my ideas, and one of the things that I was concerned about uh, with Azucena is that um, it's often, she's not often portrayed in productions as Verdi had intended for her to be portrayed. He specifically said that he did not want her played as insane, and, uh, but yet he writes hall hallucinations. <laughs> what, he, what he meant by that was, and there was no terminology for it at that time, because Freud hadn't even written his interpretation of dreams yet, was that She's not a schizophrenic, and she makes her decisions as acts of will, and she's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a different, a different problem. And because she is um, superstitious, and the whole opera was, this is the pain that superstitious, superstition can cause, um, she believes that the reason why she has these flashbacks is because she has not avenged her mother. Therefore, she thinks that if she gets one of the DeLuna brothers killed, she will stop having these hallucinations. More Make, death. Yeah. But, it, what, but if you look at it that way, the plot makes perfect sense. What she does makes perfect sense. I, I want to spend a little time talking about your website because so many opera singers these days are right up there with the Internet. You have your own DoloresAjek.com, which is uh, something you've been behind. And I think if anybody spends any time on it, you're able to find out more about you not only as a singer, but all sorts of other passions that you have. Your poetry is there. How did that come about? Um, I needed a place where I could show other aspects of what I do. Um, there are... Singing by nature tends to make people very narrow in their focus, and by necessity, because um, singing requires a tremendous amount of, of skill and ability and concentration and a lot of time. And it's easy to get lost in that trying to be an opera singer, be an artist. It, 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 it can eat up all your time. And if you don't expand on other aspects of your life, it will catch up with you artistically. Um, and uh, I wanted to show a different side of me that, that I'm interested in other things besides... You're a painter? There's some yes. Pic there's some examples of your painting there. Yes. Some gardening yes. there, <laughs> poetry. Yes. And I guess the most surprising to me, I guess there was a science and technology button. Oh, yes. Where, where, do, you, what do, you, where do you go at the DoloresAjek.com well, with science and technology? Well, it, one of the things that's always fascinated me is what, does the, what is the brain really doing when one is performing? And it's, it's, uh, it's very intriguing to me that, for example, that the part of the brain that controls consonants is totally different than the part of the brain that controls vowels. Um, I have no idea. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to learn that 
musicians, if musicians are trained before the age of 10, that their brain is actually different. The corpus, the mid-sagittal area of the corpus callosum is actually thicker and bigger. And th that's, that's the part of the brain that, that brings the different sides together. And, and it, I'm going to need diagrams. <laughs> it's right in the center of the brain. It's okay. actually shaped sort of like this. And what it does is, one of the things that, uh, uh, which I've really become aware of doing Verdi's, one of the things that typifies a Verdi um, approach to singing is, is extremes of dynamics, extremes of pianissimo, fortissimo, extremes of tempi, extremes of um, uh, uh, coloration and um, range. And uh, the brain, when it does these things, it has to tap into these different things instantly. He has to go from one thing to another instantly, and they all have to be connected to each other. Um, one of the things that separates the men from the boys, as far as musicians is concerned, is can a, can a uh, musician tap out two different rhythms at the same time? See, I always had trouble with piano. I couldn't have one hand do <laughs> a different thing than the other one. That was a trouble for me. Yes, and uh, you can always tell when a conductor conducts like this. You're in trouble. When both hands move at the same time. Can't do it at the same yes. time. Yeah, you know you're in trouble. Yeah, I'm afraid we're out of time. I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and thank for singing you. for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a it's a real pleasure. Dolores Zanche can be heard from October 11th through October 27th in the Metropolitan Opera's new production of Norma. For more information.